Okay, so to kind of transition to being able to use these shortcuts, let's look at this function as kind of like two functions working together and remember what we know about each of these. If I were to graph y equals the absolute value of x plus 1, so the first let's remind ourselves what the absolute value of x looks like. Looks like this. Ooh. Right, the absolute value of 0 is 0. The absolute value of 1 is 1. The absolute value of 2 is 2. And for negatives, vice versa. We have the absolute value of negative 2 is also positive 2. The absolute value of negative 1 is positive 1. So we get this nice nice shape to help us study how changes to the, the function affect the graph. Okay. Uh, so when we look at y equals the absolute value of x plus 1, where plus 1 is inside the absolute value, what did that graph look like compared to what the original graph? Just this part of it, just the plus 1 inside of the absolute value. Aiden? It it would move left one. Okay, so the adding one inside the absolute value would move it left one. That's kind of looking okay. Okay, so the the x plus one would be a graph that is moved to the left one because we have to put in x values that are one less than usual to find the the vertex and all of its surrounding points. Okay, what about this guy? That, well, I guess we'll color it a different color, like green. That guy, when we subtract the two from the absolute value, so besides Aiden, what happens with that graph? How does that look, graph look like compared to the absolute value of x? Tyler, you must not be paying attention because you don't need to do any of this instruction at all. Why don't you just tell me when we subtract 2 from the absolute value of x, how would this graph look compared to the regular graph? From right. From right here, you go down. No, this is just absolute value of x minus 2. Nothing else. No. It's the other one. Starting here. Yes. Oh. Down 2. Good. So you guys are like. Do that. Moving oh. down two and branching off uh, <laughs> there. This is looking really bad. It's okay. Thank you. It's still looking bad. I don't know what to do. Oh, it's all right. You'll get it next time. So, Subtract, or sorry, adding one inside of the parentheses causes a shift to the left one. Subtracting two outside the parentheses shifts it down two. And so together, shifting to the left one and down two, we'll see a graph that is shifted to the left one and down two. Should look something like this. Yeah, it kind of looks like that. Something like that. This looks awful, of course. So Wait, why is it both of them? I'm going to erase this. Yeah, this might okay. be horrible. We're just rough sketching it to see what we would expect. What do I expect to see? Uh, oh, there we go. Huh. Uh, if we were to look at a table of this, look at the absolute value of x plus 1. Minus 2. Remember that when we get it 0 inside of the absolute value, we know we found the vertex. When 0 is what happens inside the absolute value, that's a signal that we found where the vertex is. Okay, at least where the x value, the, 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 where the x, what x value will find the vertex at. So what number does it take to make the inside of this absolute value a zero? Oh, one. Put negative one. Negative one. So we should expect this this V shape to be centered around negative one. X is negative one. Which means if we go to the left at negative two and to the right at zero, it should give us at least a little snapshot of that symmetrical shape. Not that. Snap did come up, so there it is, I guess. 
Negative 1 plus 1 is 0. Almost. Actually, minus 2 gives us negative 2. Because I got a 0 inside the absolute value, I know that's where the vertex is. That's 100% guaranteed. If inside the absolute value you get a 0, you found the center of the vertex, or the, yeah, the center of, the, uh, of this V shape. Okay. So negative 1, right? It's moved to the left 1 and down 2. So the vertex is there. That's what I said. Negative 1, negative 2. That's what it said. That was your answer to a question I didn't ask. But it was right. No. I'd be right if it was the answer to a question I didn't ask. You asked that question. I didn't ask that question. Negative 2 in for x now. Plus 1, minus 2. Negative 2 plus 1, that's going to be a negative 1 inside there. Absolute value of negative 1 minus 2. Absolute value of negative 1 is 1. 1 minus 2 is negative 1. So negative 2, negative 1. And 0 now. 0 plus 1 inside the absolute value, minus 2. Absolute value of 1, minus 2. Absolute value of 1 is 1, minus 2 is also negative 1. So 0, negative 1. Straight line here. And you can safely bet on the graph going through this point, and this one, and this one, and this one. Going at a slope of 1 to the right and a slope of negative 1 to the left. Whoa, 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 whoa. whoa. When you got right there, how? So you have 0 plus 1. No, go over here. Go over here. Yeah, right there. Okay, it's 0 plus 1 right there. Yep. Then how would that minus 2? Oh, I keep doing that. So it would be, wouldn't it be negative 1? And it is. Okay. How much? You take the absolute value of 1 first, that's 1. 1 minus 2, negative 1. Um, number 20. steeper, good. And subtracting 4, just like subtracting 2 in the last example, makes the graph do what? Go down 4. Down 4. Oh. So it should be 4 times steep. So if we took it 4 times four. 2. Or 4 times 0. What is your question? Yeah. Okay. So it should be 4 times the steep and down Four. So I could, I could move the vertex down four. One, two, three, four from normal. And from there, I know it should be four times the steep. Usually, the steepness takes it up one and over one, up one and over one. When it goes over one now, it should go up four. That would make it four times the steep. And when it goes over another one, it should go up another four. And same in the opposite direction. If it goes to the left one, it should go up four. To the left one, it should go up four. How do you know it doesn't go down? What would cause the graph to point downward? What? Negative 4. So mm -hmm. if it was times negative, right? Whatever that number is. If it was yeah. a negative we're multiplying by, well, now all those positive numbers would be negative. Well, it could go negative, too. And it could go positive. What do you mean? It could be like 4 times negative 1. But we'll never get a negative one here. Why? Absolute value is always going to be positive or zero. <coughs> never negative. Oh. So you take the absolute value, we're going to get zero. That's the smallest number we'll get, or we'll get a positive. So we'll never take the absolute value and get a negative. Uh, this graph. So 
still going up. If it were going down, it would be because of a negative there. Just to confirm this, let's draw a table. What time do you have to value that kind of score? Okay, I think it's centered right at x is zero, just like a, a normal absolute value. So I'll just look at zero, negative one, and positive one. So it's the left, a little bit to the right. So four times the absolute value of zero minus four. That's zero minus four, negative four, just like I thought it would be. Uh, four times negative one minus four. Absolute value of negative one, Kyler, is? One. One, so that thing we're multiplying by four is a one, right? Four times one. Four times one is four. Minus four is? Here, four times the absolute value of positive one. The absolute value of positive one is also one. Four times one is four minus four again is zero. And that's what we expected to see. Just by saying that it should be down four and four times as steep, we just kind of confirmed there that <coughs> we do have symmetry. This is down at negative four. These are both at zero. So we know that the symmetry is right there on that vertical line. Has it moved left or right? It's just right there in the middle. It did move down four, it's four times the same. If you're not sure, I think the, the easiest thing you can do, I, I mean, the best thing you can do is just to notice its horizontal change, right? Notice its horizontal shift left or right, and you'll know where the center is, and you can plug in numbers around there. And you'll be able to find that symmetry and all that kind of stuff. You don't have to worry about it steeper or whatever. Okay. So figure out where that center is left or right and look around there and find those points and you'll know where B goes off from there. Isn't just the like four times the absolute value of x, isn't that just basically the slope? Kind of, yes. This if you think if you're looking at the right side of the graph always, then yes. This has a slope of positive four. On the other side, What's the slope? Negative four. Negative four. So we get the, the positive, the negative. So if we did, I don't like to use that as a rule because it can get a little confusing if you're right. Like if there was a four there, there you got the slope of four. If it's a negative four, then the right side of it would have a slope of negative four. But then the right side, the left side would have a, an opposite slope. It would have a positive four slope. Okay. So you can use that as well. You can use that as your slope. Yeah? So can you have as many absolute values inside of absolute values as you want? Absolute values inside of absolute values. We haven't done that yet, right? Yeah. Okay. Sure, you could. Uh, I think after. I think after like one um, level in, it would be kind of redundant, right? Because the absolute, that first absolute value is going to give you a positive, and you take an absolute value of a positive. So you could. You can nest them inside each other as much as you want. The absolute value of the absolute value of the absolute value of negative three. Yeah. As a simple example. Well, this part, uh, the absolute value of negative 3 is 3. The absolute value of 3 is 3. The absolute value of 3 is 3. Yeah. But of course, you can, inside there, you could be adding things and multiplying. Sure, they're completely, completely nestable functions. What's that? Well, it could be like, uh, like negative 3. Sorry, negative 3. Right, negative 3. And then put the signs on it. Absolute value. Yeah, times. Times. Three. Times three. Or oh, absolute value. And then have like it on the <laughs> So three like an absolute value like that? Yeah, but have like times two three. No, no, not like that. Not like this. Okay, put on another. Okay, move the three back over here. Here. Yeah. Now put like times. Like times like that. Yeah, and then put two lines on the three. Like this? Yeah, and then in another sign. Yeah. Like that? Wait. Wouldn't that make a difference though? Well, I guess that we're to, it depends on what you mean by a difference compared to what. Thank you. I don't know. But uh, we would just take, look at all the absolute values. This would be absolute value of, of negative 3 would be 3. Absolute value of positive 3 would be 3. 3 times 3 would be 9. The absolute value of nine. Nine. Okay. That's what, that's what uh, would happen. Then. But yeah, you can have absolute values inside absolute values. Um, all right. So let's put everything away except for piece of paper, calculator. Oh man, I got to keep time. Right there. So.
so if I just started there and I didn't really know anything else, at least knowing where it's centered, I could plug things in. And it's no longer random. I'm going to choose these values uh, very specifically. I know it's centered around 0. I've got a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right. It's going to find those points for me, no problem. Okay. What's the difference between Apex and GX again? There's just different names. Like, your name's oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Right. My name's Mr. Stewart. And so now we know who we are. That's all it is. Okay, so negative 3 times the absolute value is 0. Negative 3 times absolute value is 0. Absolute value is 0. Is 0. So negative 3 times 0 is 0. So we have 0, 0. And I know that point is what point? We go off of it. Right, we go off of it. It's called the vertex. Uh, let's go to the right one from there. I should, I should see some symmetry around that point if I know what I do. Go over one down. Absolute value of 1 is 1 times negative 3 is negative 3. So 1, negative 3. Now, if I've been you know, logging all these changes away, I know that the negative should make it go upside down. The 3 should make it 3 times the steep. Right? So then I know what Kylo knew to move over 1 and down 3. And I also should know that there's a point in there. But if I wasn't sure, I could plug in negative 1. Absolute value of negative 1 is 1. Negative 3 times 1 is also negative 3. So we know it's centered around 0. It opens downward. And it's got 3 times as big a slope. The right side of it, as Ray said, has a slope of negative 3. Uh, other graph here. Uh, where will its center be? Will it be here? Will it be over there? Will it be over there? Will it It'll move, it should be over to the right three, right? X minus three tells me that it should be over to the right three. So, I should be able to, with accuracy, say that it centers at three, so let's go back to two, over to four. Or I might know that, okay, it's gonna move to the right three, it's gonna be twice as steep, the right side is gonna have a slope of two, the other side's gonna be here, and I could drive it, I could draw it that way. But if at least I know where the center is, left or right, and then I can move around about the center and find some points very easily. So 2 times the absolute value of 2 minus 3, that's the absolute value of negative 1. Negative 1 times, or the absolute value of negative 1 is 1, times 2 is 2. Uh, 2 times 3 minus 3, absolute value of 3 minus 3, 0 times 2 is 0. And 2 times absolute value of 4 minus 3, that's the absolute value of 1, which is 1 times 2 is 2. So this over 1, 2, 3, so 3, 0, 2, 2. So we see a V shape centered around 3 move to the right 3, and it's twice as steep as your normal V shape. Either way you went, it's faster if I can recognize that this is upside down, it's three times as steep. I'm done. I haven't moved left or right, I haven't moved up or down. This guy here has moved to the right 3, it's twice as steep. I put a, a point right there for the vertex. I go up 2 into the right 3, up 2 into the left 3, and I'm done. But if at least, if you you need to plug numbers into the function, which is fine. At least know that it's just to the right three so that you know where the center is and where you can plug points in and, and find the symmetrical points. So once you get out your notes, I want you to create two tables. And here it says S, P, this is S and A. So two different tables, two different functions. What do you think A stands for? You know what I think P stands for? Um, um, yes. Perseverance. Yes. Stands for perimeter. We're talking about a rectangle here. That human characteristics. So we're talking about a rectangle that has side length S and uh, this side is twice as big. Twice as big as whatever that side is. 
you need to tweet this out more often. I don't need to, you're doing it. <laughs> All right, so now if I give you a value for s, so that you know how big this is, you know this yeah. is twice as big, you should be able to figure out the perimeter and the area, right? Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so let's start off. Simple s is 2. This is, you know, this is fine. What does that stand for side or something? That stands for side. Oh. Alright, so if the S is 2, then how long is this side? 12. It's not 12. This side's two, this side's four, this side's two, this side's four. So what's the perimeter? Twelve. Twelve. Just add up all the sides, right? Or eight plus four, just two of these plus two of these. Eight plus four. What's the area? Eight. Did you say the perimeter is bigger than the area? It can be. It is in this situation. Well, actually, they're two different things, so you can't compare them. Exactly. That's exactly what I was looking for, actually. The number is bigger, but how can perimeter be bigger than area? They're two different things. We're comparing, we're comparing rulers to apples. square rulers. We're, we're comparing linear measures to square measures. So, uh, no oranges. Yeah, we need no oranges here. Okay, so for that, let's change this to four. What if this is four? What will be the perimeter then? Twenty-four. Area B. Dude, you can't just say it out loud. Don't be like okay. that. This is dirt. Okay. I found this. The area of room B. What are you doing, Clint? <laughs> I found this in the hazard system. What is what it? Is it? <laughs> the tape measure. What? Why is there a. That's There's so many just weird this things in your class. Janitor. Wait, where was that? Yeah. In there. Inside of that. The why were you even in there? Well, I would like a pump and it just opened up. Alright, so what's the perimeter? Pump and it's the perimeter. So perimeter? 24. 24. Because this is, if this is 4, then how big is this? That equals 8. 8, so this is 8 and this is also 4. Yes. Yeah. So 8 times 2 plus 4 times 2. Ladies and gentlemen. What's the area? 16. 16. 32. 32. Oh, oh, darn. Wow. We're starting to notice something about the way these uh, functions behave. Right? They go above. The uh, side length doubles, <laughs> the perimeter doubles. Side length doubles, area does not double. Yeah? Okay. Can we put 8 in for the side? Uh, we're gonna go six first. Six, six. six. Surgery to do. I can't stop you, right? Six. 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 Oh my gosh. Molly. Um, do you want us to write the function? No, nope. I just want you to write the. It's just gonna fill in the table. For now. For now. Uh, well, do we have the perimeter for side length six? Yeah, thirty-six. Yep. Six. Seventy-two. <coughs> Seventy-two. Yeah. Because if this is six, why yeah. this is twelve. Is sorry. What's that? Why are you <laughs> I'm sorry. Notice if this is six and this is twelve, this is also twelve, this is also six. Okay. So the perimeter is twenty-four plus twelve, thirty-six. And the area is six times twelve. 12, 7 and 72 squares we put inside that. Okay, one more time. 8. Oh my god. Really confident people not taking any notes. 48. Oh, no, brown cow. 48, eight, which means this is 16. It means the perimeter molly is? 48. 48. And the area? 128. 
Wait, what is that even up there? What is that even up there? Yeah. What is that number? Sixteen. Oh, it looks like a sixteen. Yeah, it's one twenty. This is two times S. Yeah, I know. All right. So you know, you guys already noticed. If you just click on the draw like that. You already noticed what I was wanting to see if you would tap onto, and that is, these have a different kind of a pattern, right? Mm -hmm. So we thought this goes from 12 to 24, so maybe this would go from 8 to 16, but it didn't. It went from 8 to 32. Right. Yeah. Right. Unexpectedly. But this continues to go up by how much? Uh, 12. So this guy goes up by 2, and this one goes up by 12. Yes. What kind of a pattern would you buy? Well, that one's like. Whatever six, I forgot the word use that means. Okay, so generally it's a linear, linear pattern. Linear. That's what I was how do we, how do we say that? Like, how do we know a linear pattern is a linear it's pattern? Function. Not just function. Um, What's continuous? The rate of change. The rate of change is continuous. Yes, yeah. the rate of change. So, what was what is it exactly, Grace? What is the rate of change? Six over one. Six over one. Twelve over two. Which simplifies six over to one. six over one. Six. This one's six over one. But if we look at the rate of change over here, it's four over this one. This one goes up by. How much does it go up by? Five by twenty-four. Four. It goes up by twenty-four. This one goes up by two. Okay. Well, hopefully then this goes up by twenty-four. And then that goes up, goes up by, by two. And then that goes up by forty-eight. Forty-eight. No, forty-eight. Thirty-two to seventy-two. No, it's not just forty. Oh, never mind. It is. It's just like forty-eight. I'm joking. From thirty-two to seventy-two is forty. Seventy-two to one twenty-eight. That equals fifty-six. Fifty-six. So it's constantly changing. There, it's not just six to one. There, twelve to two. It's not even uh, twelve to one. Because here we see a, two, a change of 2, and now this is changing 40. So that rate of change is changing. So what kind of function is this? This one's linear. This one? Continuous. Non-linear. Ow! Okay, now there's lots of different non-linear functions. That's linear, and so far we'll just call things that are not linear non-linear. Okay, this function is a is belongs to a class of functions called quadratic functions. Oh, I heard about that. But it, we don't need to know that. You don't need to recognize that this is quadratic. Not yet. Okay. So now Molly suggested we write this function. What would this function be? Um, that would be what. Or yeah. equals six. Oh, y equals six s, and the other one would be oh. y equals s times oh two times s. So two times s would be in parentheses. Or we can multiply s times two times s, right? We can put the s's together, multiply the two s's. What's s times s? Four. S squared. Two s squared. Two. And because this s is squared, and this s is not. Right? This s, the square on the s is is why you would call it quadratic. When you see an s squared or x squared, okay, uh, then we're in the quadratics. And if it was to the, if it was s cubed, we'd be in the cubics. We're in the fourth. If it was s to the fourth, we'd be in the fourth degree polynomials. Is that really a, I guess we call it a quartic. How do you even remember this stuff? Wait, I can remember uh, stuff from like two days ago. Well, a cube, like s cubed is a cubic, so the fourth is quartic, right? Quart four. four. Five, quintic, all these prefixes just have to do with whatever number it is. And uh, they apply in a lot of different situations. Anyway, uh, there you have it. We're really just trying to figure out, is the function that we're given by graph, by table, or however, is it linear, or is it not? 
If it is, then what do we know about that linear function? What would we see? So on the homework, are we supposed to be like finding the my question pattern? first. How do I know this is linear? Um, it's a constant rate, rate of change. change. Constant rate of change, not constant Got rate of change. change. Bridger, your question. So on our homework, are we just trying to find the pattern and then writing down the formula for finding it? If you have a table, certainly. No, you don't even have to write down the formula. You just have to yes. say, is it linear or not linear? I love that. There might be one, two questions that ask yeah. you to write a formula, but I don't think there are. I have a question. How can you? <laughs> <laughs> you almost got it, bro.